Okay, so welcome to the June presentation of the Historical Society of St. Catharines. President Dave Willer is unavailable this evening, so you'll have to settle for me. I'm John Brenton, and you may know me as the newsletter editor for the Historical Society. Just a couple of announcements before we get started with Stan's um, uh, presentation. First announcement is take a look at the website, the St. Catharines Historical Society website. It's, uh, it's really been improved. We've been working on putting a lot of more information into it, uh, enhancements. We've got more archived newsletters appearing all the time. I think right now we've grown back 20 years and we're still uh, gonna be adding to that. Keep checking for new articles. There's a new one there under local history that you might find interesting. Um, also a reminder regarding memberships. If you haven't paid your dues for 2021, please do so to support the Historical Society. It's only $15 for a single or $20 for family membership. And the information again is on the website. You can even pay through the website these days. Um, and, and after this session tonight, uh, we'll be taking a couple of months off and uh, I hope to be putting out a newsletter prior to our September meeting. Um, and that will sort of get everybody lined up for the next part of our season. And there's a whole new season of, of speakers that we've got lined up, exciting lineup once more. So with no more delay, I'd like to introduce Stan Krzyzewski. So Stan is a retired librarian. He's a planning consultant. He's a public speaker. In retirement, he redefined himself as a curator, a writer, and an independent scholar. He continues to give speaking engagements, and he also has four Facebook pages that he looks after with a total of 1,600 people following. Stan developed the curriculum and taught classes in information entrepreneurship at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies, University of Western Ontario in London, and the Faculty of Information Studies at the University of Toronto. He has a Master of Library Science. He has a Bachelor of Arts in English and Philosophy and a Master's in Philosophy. His achievements have earned him many accolades. He's got the Award of Merit and Public Librarian of the Year. Uh, as an author, he writes every single day. He's published many books. He's contributed to many articles and book chapters as well. He's a proud independent publisher. As a philosopher, Stan organized and facilitated philosopher cafes and open philosophical discussions held in coffee shops, libraries, and other gathering places. And he even wrote a book about that. Stan has facilitated over 150 such cafes on a wide range of topics from the nature of art to the meaning of wine. Stan is active in his community and particularly around his Polish background and his love for history. Some of his involvements include the curator of the Orlinski Museum and archives of the Polish Armed Forces in Mississauga and the Canadian Polish Research Institute. So all the way from Facer Street, St. Catharines, now living in London with his wife, Tina, daughter, Marianne, and her partner, Paul. His son is out west in Pemberton, BC. Without more ado, I present to you Stan Krzyzewski. Thank you very much, John. And uh, yeah, I like listening to about myself. Um, so you noted none of my qualifications that really allow me to be a historian, although I think that's what I'm best at. So there you go. Uh, credentials only mean so much. And I've always been one that likes the fact that I have certain credentials and then pursue other things. But anyway, to get to the point, I'm really pleased to be able to speak about Laura Blackwell to the Historical Society of St. Catharines. And she's also known lately as Countess Laura Gozdala de Turchinovich. And I believe that her story deserves to be told, and that's why I'm happy to be doing this. She had a very interesting, very life, one that crossed the paths of many people, many influential people. She had a life that made a difference, but ironically, she's a life that's largely forgotten. And for me, her story is particularly important because she came from St. Catharines, and I consider myself somebody who came from St. Catharines, but she has interesting links to Canada, the United States, and to Poland, which, again, is the area I'm interested in. And I'm very, uh, whoops, 
<laughs> Who's got the dog? Okay. I first got hooked on her story kind of by accident. I went to see Edie Williams at the Special Collections at Brock University one day. And she asked me if I'd ever heard of Laura Blackwell, Laura de Turchinovich. And I had to admit, I'd never heard of the lady. And that was made me curious because I pride myself in knowing a lot about history, St. Catherine's history and Polish Canadian history. So that got me going, that got me hooked. And since then, that was several years ago, I've tried to follow Laura across North America, both digitally and physically, and even to Poland, and I've really enjoyed the struggle. I should say right up front, there's a lot of holes in her story because there are only elements that you can find. And then there are big questions that I'd like to answer that I simply don't know the answer because I haven't found the information. Well, to go back to the beginning, let's see if I can make this move. No. Okay, wake up. Okay. Oh, there we go. So the early years in St. Catharines. Laura Christine Blackwell was, began life in St. Catharines on August 28, 1878. She was a tenth child of Walter and Euphemia Blackwell. And I don't know much about her parents. Walter was an apparently an American and Euphemia was of Scottish descent. The family had just recently moved to Georgetown to from Georgetown to St. Catharines. And if you look at the directory for St. Catharines for 1877, it lists a Walter Blackwell stonecutter living at 57 Queen Street. Then we have a gap, which is typical of Laura's life. The next directory listing for a Blackwell does not appear till 1901. So we're almost 20 years later. And it lists a Kizzy Blackwell or a Keziah Blackwell, same person, who a vocalist who was listed at living at 3 St. Paul Street. What happened to the family in between is hard to say. Laura's sister Keziah was a trained vocalist and musician, and she was popular as a music teacher, and she organized uh, many successful recitals around St. Catharines, including places like at St. Barnabas Church that had an active music program, Knox Presbyterian Church, I must admit my mother's church, and places like that. And at least two of Laura's sisters married and one became Mrs. Hodgson and the other Mrs. Arthur Lloyd and both lived in St. Catharines in 1916. So there's some of the St. Catharines connections, but it's not clear exactly where she was, how long she was, what she did here is somewhat unknown. Now Edie Williams at Brock did conduct some early uh, research into an early life and somewhere fairly early on, Laura and presumably at least her father left St. Catharines for the booming building opportunities in Larimer County, Colorado. So we see her popping up in Colorado. Later, she appears in Chicago. But by the time she was in Chicago, she was making regular visits back to St. Catharines. So that seems to be an ongoing trait of her. She did come back to the city fairly often. And in 1900, for instance, the Daily Standard reports that there would be a grand farewell recital by Miss Laura Christine Blackwell, one of the leading sopranos from the Grand Opera Company. The farewell concert was in response to Laura's leaving St. Catharines to begin her engagement at the Metropolitan Opera House, New York City. So here's our girl starting to make it big, but comes back to the city to say farewell. Now it's important to note because we also wonder how big was her opera career? Did she really make it? And you can tell by the people who attended her when she came to St. Catharines. Several of the people that came with her were with the Grau Grand Opera Company. In many ways, the Grau Opera Company was the, the preeminent opera company in the United States. Several of Laura's friends from this company performed with her in St. Catharines. And Maurice Grau was part of a partnership which ran a number of theaters in New York, Boston, and in England, and including the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City and the Covent Garden Opera in London. So at an early age, Laura was already in the higher echelons of operatic society and had made good contacts. It would be nice to know how she did that, but again, that's one of those things I simply don't know. In the 1890s, there was not enough of a market to sustain artists in Canada. If you wanted to be properly trained and to earn a living as an artist, you had to move to the United States or to Europe for advanced training. And society in the 19th century, unlike ours to some degree, was very mobile. It was fairly easy to move from Canada to the United States and back again, or to Europe. And to be a successful an artist, you had to sign up with an American agent or manager. And Laura had done that as well. 
by signing up with Maurice Grau. So she was on well on her way to having a successful opera career. One of the first records that we have of Laura performing in the United States was has to do with the opening of a new space for the temperance movement, Willard Hall, quite famous, located in the Women's Temple in Chicago. Laura would have been 15 at that time. And uh, I mean, I'd like to think, again, I wish I knew, but I'm suspecting she had something to do all while she was there with the Hull House, with people like Jane Addams, who were early on in the early women's movement, because she herself became such an independent woman. And you wonder, where did she pick up that knowledge, that skills? My best guess is when she was in Chicago that she met with some of these early feminists. After Chicago, she pops up in Topeka, Kansas. So obviously the girl got around. And at that time, most of the tra travel would have been done by train, not all that easy, but she seemed to travel where she could play. And uh, when she was um, in Topeka, she was introduced as a graduate of the Chicago Dramatic School. And again, that links partly to the feminist movement as well. And finally, she shows up in New York City where she sang in a concert in the YMCA hall for the benefit of the Morningside Baptist Church. News reports of that event state that the concert included Miss Laura Christine Blackwell, a young soprano popular in concert and whose Scotch songs are sung as only a Scotch girl can sing them. Now it's interesting because she was Canadian, her mother might have been Scotch, so how Scotch she actually was, well, they obviously thought she was. Um, but again, Laura was able to take on different personalities and certainly sell herself to people her entire life. And while she was in New York, Laura did make several trips to St. Catharines again. And when she did, she performed, including a concert at St. George's Anglican Church. And again, the local paper reported that of the soloist, Miss Blackwell, who made her first appearance since returning from New York, where she studied for two years, showed herself the possessor of a soprano voice of good quality and considerable compass. And again, in New York, I wish I knew how, she started to move in the highest social circles, perhaps by being in the opera world, that was a way of being invited into it. But for example, she had a devoted friend, one of her closest friends in New York City was somebody named Frank Seymour Hastings. He happened to write books on navigation and on the cattle industry, but more interestingly, he was a son-in-law of Elias Cornelius Benedict, who was a wealthy banker and yachtsman with a beautiful home on Fifth Avenue, and Laura often sang in his music room. Um, and we know he was important because uh, Benedict was the inspiration for Eggs Benedict, so he obviously had arrived, at least from that point of view. Whoops, go the other way. Now, around 1902, Laura, 24, came to Germany and performed at Beirut and in Munich. And along the way, she also stopped in England where she took on the role of Michaela in Carmen with the Moody Manors Opera Company. And the Moody Manors Company was also a very well-known and successful traveling opera organization. So again, that was a good connection for her. However, in Munich, that became the city of love for Laura. And I get this out of her novel. It was here that she really came in contact with Europe and its culture and society. She would go out and see the changing of the guard in the huge square in front of the Royal Palace. And she would meet Stanislav with his pointed mustache, aristocratic bearing, and hand-kissing elegant at the Temple of Love, more formally known as the Diana Temple in the Munich Hofgarten. And you can see the uh, Temple of Love there, and then one of the buildings, the palace buildings uh, in Munich. So very romantic surroundings. And that's where she met this fellow. Well, oh, going the wrong way. And Stanislav. Stanislav Turchinovich. Aren't you guys glad I speak Polish? Otherwise that name would be messed up big time. Anyway, he was born in April 21st, 1875 in Lublin in Poland. He was a specialist in hydrology and soils. In other words, he made his living as a scientist. He was mobilized in World War I and served with the Russian army and served as inspector in chief of the sanitary engineer. So he had a fairly, he had a good education. He had a substantive position. He also trained in music, but that was not his occupation. On June 6, 26, 1907, 
Laura married Stanislav Turchinovich, Count Gustava in Krakow, which was then part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. She was a young woman from Canada, and he was an aristocrat from an old family, so you can only think it had to be love. It is easy to see how Laura from a small city in Ontario might fall in love with a mysterious count with his Polish aristocratic manners. Now, one of the big questions around Laura is always, was she really a countess with the house, high sounding, high, high sounding name, and was Stanislav really a count? And that's a tricky question to answer. Gozdava, that middle name, is actually the name of a coat of arms. So that coat of arms there is the Gozdava coat of arms. And maybe many noble and gentry families were entitled to use it. There might have been hundreds of families that had the right to use that crest. And that's common in Poland. And it is likely that the Turchinowicz family had inherited the right to this crest. And that they also owned a lot of property. So they certainly were a significant family. Now, they also like this thick D-E, D, in front of the name, so it would be Stanislav de Turchinovich. And uh, that, of course, is an adaptation from the French of the use of the um, D-E as a nobiliary particle, used to si signal that the no fa that family was noble. Laura admitted in one of her writings that our title doesn't mean much, although it does give us the lilies of France in our press, and you can see the lilies of the France there. Now, it's interesting, Stanislav himself never called himself Count, never put the DE in his name, while Laura used it at every opportunity. And just out of interest, a couple of months ago, I decided to stick DE in my name and nobody seemed to notice. I put it on Facebook, I used that as my name. I guess you can do it, if you wish, you can, any of us could do that. When, when she married though, she left one world behind and landed in another. And that had to be quite a shock to her system. She landed in the world of Eastern Europe and Poland, which was to become her adopted country. And for a short while, it would define her life and her role in it. In marrying into Polish gentry, she had to give up her religion and her country. It would have been from Stanisław and his family that Laura learned of Poland's sad history and of the current occupiers. Laura took on a Polish perspective, which included a historic hatred of Germany, and that shows up in her writings later. In Krakow, Laura had her daughter, Wanda, was born, and her two twin sons, who became known as Peter and Paul, kind of a good Eastern reflection there. And they were born in Krakow, which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, although later when they moved to Suwałki, that put them in the Russian Empire. So let's go on to Suwałki. There's the family in Suwałki, the three kids and Laura in the top and then some of the servants and some of the girls in the lower picture. In the summer of 1914, the family had settled themselves in a new summer cottage outside of the town of Suwałki. Now, Suwałki is in the Lake District of today's Poland, and it's known as an attractive kind of summer area. People would go there for holidays and that kind of thing, an idyllic setting. Now, they seem to have a pretty good life because the previous winter, uh, Stanisław and Laura had spent their winter in Nice, uh, apparently, Stanislav liked to gamble in Monte Cassino when they were in holiday. Uh, Monte Carlo, not Monte Cassino, and getting crisscrossed with some of my other projects. And it maybe was on trips to France that they started to insert the DE into their surname. And she had a life of leisure with servants, domestics, a nanny, and governess for her children. And that bottom picture shows some of the serving staff. I'm assuming that's Laura with the big hat standing there, but the rest would be serving staff. While at the summer village villa, Laura learned that war had been declared, and Laura took her children and joined her husband in the town of Suwałki. Laura and her husband were involved in organizing the Red Cross for the regional governments in the area, and a hospital was set up in part of their house. Their house was a huge rambling place, so that's how it's described. And within the house, they had beds for 250 patients, and, the soon, and soon the wounded started arriving from the front, and the hospital was soon well overcrowded. You got to remember the house or the town of Suwałki was very ne near the battlefront, and the armies actually moved back and forth as the front moved through Suwałki. The Battle of Tannenberg and the Battle of the Missourian Lakes were fought between Russia and Germany, and those battles took place close to where Laura was living. And the battle brought considerable prestige to Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. This was his big victory as a military general. 
And Laura was forced to host him at her home, which would have been one of the grander homes in Suvalki. And he, she lived, he lived with them for a while and she was expected to cook for him and that kind of thing. As an American citizen, however, Laura made attempts to get her and her children out of the war zone. And on September 6, 1915, Laura was given permission with her children to travel to Berlin. And from there, she hoped to get back to the United States. And I can say she traveled in style. When she stayed in Berlin, she stayed at one of the better hotels. She did never traveled poorly, I don't think, her entire life. Um, later, she sailed from the United States on the new Amsterdam from Rotterdam. And to my knowledge, she never saw Stanislav again. And there's no information as to whether she arrived with any significant amount of money. I'm assuming she had something, but I don't know or whether Stanislav provided her and the children with any ongoing support. There's no record of that, I can't tell you. But with the outbreak of World War I, the Edwardian age was over, the golden age of opera was over, motion pictures were becoming a central form of entertainment. It can be said that Laura's entire life story has to be seen of a version of survival of the fittest. Laura seems to have struggled throughout her life to overcome the obstacles which were thrown at her of birth, of status, and then she had to earn enough money to support herself and her family, both as a single mother and as an independent woman. And I don't think in 1918, single mothers or independent women would have been all that well received. Anyway, she wrote, oops, always the wrong button. When she came back to the United States, the first thing that happened to her was that she found herself an object of persecution. She received anonymous letters threatening her with death and telephone calls warning her to be quiet. And presumably these threats came from the German embassy or at least from the German organization, trying to keep her shut, her mouth shut as to the conditions in the battlefields. But she had kept a diary of her days in Suvalki when the Germans and the Russians were fighting there. And based on this diary, Laura wrote a book about her experiences during the Russian invasion. And the book was When the Prussians Came to Canada, uh, came to Poland, they never did get to Canada, thank God. Anyway, um, that book is easily to get. I just picked up a copy on the internet one day. Uh, I might have paid $10 for it. So it's still readily available, it seems. Based on that book, she went on speaking engagements throughout the United States and parts of Canada promoting her book. And she wrote the book at the request of persons interest in Polish relief work and also in people wanting the United States to enter the war. The book became a relative bestseller back then. It's likely that her book was also part of a larger propaganda effort to convince the United States to enter the war. And the book describes some of the horrible events that occurred during the German assault in, in that area. And the proceeds from the sale of the book went to support the efforts of the Red Cross in Poland and Lithuania. You've got to remember that the town of Suwałki, technically in Poland, but was very close to Lithuania. And when borders were shifting, at one time it would have been under Lithuanian control and another time under Polish control. It ended up under Polish control, but for a while Lithuanians ran the place. So as, uh, and again, as soon as Laura got back to the United States, and I wish I knew how she did this, she entered the top echelons of society. She was sought after by the rich and famous. Maybe that her earlier opera, opera career opened these doors, or maybe it was a title of countess that impressed people in the United States, or perhaps it was because she was the author of a best-selling book. For whatever reasons, this girl from St. Catharines who started life in modest surroundings, was welcomed into high society again. In her many speaking engagements, she often shared the platform and then stayed with many wealthy and influential people, names some of us would recognize, and there she is on the podium with these famous folks. During World War I, the arts, lectures, and entertainment emerged as effective means to raise money and became staples of life in Canada and the United States for such patriotic causes as relief for Belgium, relief for Poland, the Red Cross needed funds. So it was a very popular thing to undertake and people were very generous with them. From late 1915 to 1920, Laura traveled continuously, gave talks based on her book and experiences and promoted the Polish cause at numerous gatherings across the United States. At these presentations, she was a tremendous success. Every time I read a description, people raved about how effective she was as a presenter. Uh, both in Canada and the United States. 
And in that time, she made a huge number. I counted almost 200 presentations within that time period. And this is traveling quite widely at the same time. And occasionally, she would even make to St. Catharines. So in April 7, 1917, she did come to St. Catharines to give a lecture. The local newspaper reported on it with great enthusiasm, be partly because Laura Blackwell was returning as a marquee to Gozdala Turchinovich. It's interesting, sometimes she's countess, sometimes she's a marquee. Uh, but anyway, she's always the wife of a Polish nobleman. And the lecture in St. Catharines was given under the auspices of the St. Catharines Red Cross Society and the St. Paul St. Uh, Street Methodist Church. Her visit was part of a book tour, which also took her to Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. And again, I love this part. While in Ottawa, Laura was a guest of their excellencies, the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire at Government House. The Duke served as Canada's 11th Governor General. And again, I don't know how Laura managed to get become the guest of the Governor General. I've done book talks in Ottawa, and I get to stay at the, uh, you know, the my hotel. But again, it emphasizes the social circles into which she was readily invited. And so she mixed with everybody. When in St. Catharines, she spoke on the sorrows of Poland. She was clad in her Polish Red Cross uh, costume of soft dove gray with a short cape of the same material, white collar and cuffs, a flowing veil of black over a close fitting white cap, long gray boots, and the Red Cross on her breast. This was a uniform that she often wore at such events. And obviously her operating and acting training was obvious help to her as she entranced the audience. And I suspect the uniform was part of that operatic dress up mode that she would have been familiar with. By this time, which was getting near the end of all these public presentations, Laura was invited I was involved as president of the Polish Reconstruction Committee, which was raising funds for training nurses and social workers to go to Poland to assist with reconstruction work. There's my little arrow. And uh, so with this, through this association, she asked the cooperation of the National War Work Council of the YWCA in recruiting young women for reconstruction work. She heard Polish girls in America to volunteer to be trained for work in Poland. And because of the color of their uniforms, the women organized under this program were called the Gray Samaritans. And you can see a picture of them. I think that picture's in New York. That, by the way, is Laura on the Lapland going to Europe. She also spoke at the camp in Niagara, the Polish army camp in Niagara on the Lake, again, supporting the Polish cause. There's a nice picture of that camp around 1918. 1918 was an incredibly busy year for Laura. And don't forget, we're, we're sitting here because of the pandemic. She was doing this during the time of the Spanish flu epidemic. And at least two of the girls that trained to be Gray Samaritans died during the epidemic. And Laura did attend those funerals. Now, things start to go a little bad for Laura about now. Some Poles in America, and you've got to remember the Polish community was not uniform. You'd basically say there was left Poles, there were right Poles, there was in between Poles, there were, they were segmented like most groups are. And some of those Poles groups started to speak out against Laura based on the fact that she sometimes charged for her presentations. And they also questioned her use of the title Countess. Was she really a Countess? And it was investigated by District Attorney Edwin Kilrow who took Laura to task. He was in charge of investigating many fake countesses, countesses and fake war charities. And he did question uh, Laura about her war lectures and writings. And Laura told him that she generally got $200 for each of her war lectures and $500 yearly in royalties, probably from the book. Now, you've got to remember, here's a woman with three children. So she had to have income from somewhere. And I assume that's very clearly where it was from. But she generally got caught up in this conflict within the Polish community. And maybe not being Polish, there probably were people that resented her participation at a fairly high level. Eventually, after much of the damage was done, the US War Department issued a statement and the statement reads, is now satisfied that this lady is entirely loyal and that she has some claim to the courtesy title de Gustava and that the funds collected by her for various charities have been properly accounted for. Um, so you can see she was vindicated, but the damage by the press and all that kind of thing to her, to her reputation was already done. 
So at this point, she started to shift her loyalties away from Poland to Lithuania. And she did try to go to Europe. Well, she did go to Europe in 1919 with her daughter Wanda. She went there to help with reconstruction, made connections. She primarily then made connections with the Lithuanian government and was appointed their representative. And she wanted to get work started in reconstruction. And she also hoped to find Stanisław for her husband, but to my knowledge, she never did. And shortly in July, she was back in the United States and now again out doing speaking engagements, but that came to an end about that time. And then Laura decided to go to the other coast. She headed off for La Jolla, California and go west. And she took her three children and off she went. And there she became a voice teacher at Studio 20, a thorough music company in San Diego. And while there, she produced musical operatic performances. Uh, again, after her war activities, giving lessons would have been a practical way for Laura to earn a living. Laura was then in her 40s, had three children, and so couldn't go back to a singing career, but she could be a director. And the 1920s was a time of prosperity and rapid development in La Jolla. Many wealthy people moved there and it was a gorgeous place to be. And La Jolla was at that time home to the Green Dragon Colony, which was a colony of artists who had collected there and it formed an own artist colony. And I feel that's why Laura ended up going there. In La Jolla, Laura presented several operettas and her press review was always very positive. The, uh, the, the reviews were always that Laura knew how to get the best out of her actors and was able to put together good performances. She served as a director of the La Jolla Opera Company and she was involved with the Professional Musicians Guild. And she also directed and staged the pageant of Esther the Beauty Queen at the La Jolla Women's Club. And if you look at this picture, you'll see a horse. <laughs> and then right behind there with a big hat, is our friend Laura. The rest, who they are, I don't know, but this is the performance in Lyle, or at least the cast. When she was uh, there a few years, the San Diego Sun ran an article uh, entitled, The Sun Takes Off Its Hat Too, and they honored several people in the area for their contribution. And among those so honored was Laura, and she was described as an indefatigable worker for advancement of music in the city, uh, who was contributed her services against this year and providing more direction. So she seemed to have been a, quite a success. Then she decided to leave La Jolla and go to Toronto. Maybe to go back to family, maybe to get back to Canada, or maybe just a better job. So in 1927, with her three, ch three children, she showed up in Toronto. So Sir Ernest McMillan, who was the Dean of the Faculty of Music at the University of Toronto, brought Laura to Toronto to develop an opera program. And together in 1928, they formed the first observatory, a conservatory, conservatory opera company. Laura was a director and under the leadership of Sir Ernest Macmillan. And again, they went on to produce operatics, uh, Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. They did it in different locations. And uh, the, again, the press was positive. It says things like Laura de Turchino, which has tri triumphed magnificently in the Hansel and Gretel production. And then they put on other things at the Regent Theater. There's another group. Now, for me, a slight interesting thing that the sets in the Hart House where a lot of these plays were performed were designed by Arthur Lismer, a member of the famous group of seven uh, Canadian artists. I'd love to see what he designed. It's very hard to see what's back there. One of my goals is to see if I can find any pictures of what Lismer actually produced. Other uh, members of the group of seven were also enlisted as set designers, and uh, it's something that I want to pursue. And uh, at the same time, when she was in Toronto, she acted as an operatic coach, teacher of voice, and a musician wanting to earn a living. While in Toronto, she again made a trip to St. Catharines, to address the Women's Canadian Club. And her presentation was in times of peace. In St. Catharines, Laura was entertained at the home of her sister, Mrs. Hodson, Ontario Street South, where a tea was held for the executive of the Women's Canadian Club. And while in Toronto, again, she won high praise, uh, very well regarded, uh, but the Great Depression came along and that kind of ground to a halt and she decided to move to Victoria. When you do research, you can find shelves of stuff about uh, Macmillan. 
uh, maybe because it was a man and he dominated the music field there for years. But even in his work, you can almost, you, if you're lucky, if you find a footnote to Laura, and again, I'm thinking women got second shrift to the men in charge. So the man became a hero, the woman sort of got forgotten. And that seems to be part of Laura's story. Again, Laura left for Victoria, rather isolated community in the late 1920s with a strong British identity. Radio is becoming a major form of entertainment. It doesn't seem that Laura ever made the transition to radio. Little theaters were popping up with a focus on a largely British repertoire. And women artists involved in theater at the time were assumed to be by definition amateurs. Although I think you could argue that Laura was anything but an amateur, but they were supposed to get married. And if they were in theater, it was an amateur thing. They weren't a full-time artist. Now, one person who was in her choir while she was there actually described her, and it's not easy to find these kind of descriptions. So James Nesbitt, local newspaper man and choir member, described her in this way. Most energetic, she was good looking, shortage and stoutish with a mass of snow white wear, hair, a most distinguished figure. When she directed her arms were outstretched, crying out, sing, sing, act, act. So you can just imagine her directing the people. She founded the Victoria Opera Epic Society in 1930 and they produced uh, five successful operas. I'm not gonna talk anymore about what they produced because there's one little thing that popped up in Victoria and I wonder if anybody here can help me with. Find it rather curious that at a general meeting of the Victoria branch, United Empire Loyalists, the speaker were Countess de Turchinovich and Dr. Hart, who were both regular members of the uh, United Empire Loyalist Society. On another occasion, Victorians of United Empire Loyalist descent were invited to attend a Rotary Cup luncheon where Turchinovich spoke, and her title of her talk was the contribution of the United Empire Loyalists to Canada and to the British Empire. Now, the UA, um, UE, UEL Association of Canada does provide a list of known Loyalist families, but there's no Blackwell on this list, although there are several Gordons, so perhaps her link to the uh, Loyalists comes through her mother's side. And again, she produced things well there, a bohemian girl, well-produced, uh, magnetic personalities, so compelling genius, the success of the opera. So she got very high reviews for all, any work she ever attempted. Uh, anyway, shortly thereafter, 1934, she moved to, let me see if I can do this right. Uh, there we go. Vancouver, 1934. She would have been 56. And once she moved to Victoria, she got out of the opera world, if you like. She didn't perform, she didn't direct anymore. But while she was there, she finished writing her second book, and it was to be a novel called Strange Altars. She, and here's her description. She wrote that book. She wrote that the book is a story, not of my life experience, yet the country, Poland as I discovered it, learning from day-to-day -day customs, traditions, and history, also entering the Catholic Church at marriage. And the second half is about war. Although she claims the book is not autobiographical, to me it's very autobiographical and some of my comments as to her life are lifted right out of that novel. That's where I get her stuff about her love affair with Stanislav and wandering around the palaces and things like that. The book was never published, unfortunately. She did submit it to publishers, but it was rejected. And uh, copies of the draft of the book can be found in the, the Turchinovich Fonds at Brock University. I was kind of sorry it wasn't produced. And I, in the back of my mind, I thought, I wonder if one could take it and print a copy of that book just to have it. It wouldn't even have to be mass produced, but it might be an interesting uh, project. After that, after her life in um, Vancouver, she left and headed for Blaine, Washington on their way to Santa Monica, California. And now we're down to her final years. Oops, go the other way. And uh, she just lived a quiet life really there, still mixed with the rich and famous. Uh, but she reports she became quite a nervous person, had trouble sleeping. In a letter to Wanda, her daughter, she writes that my dreams are all of war and the scenes I have lived, things I would rather forget but cannot. A dream which woke me. I am so nervous. War is infinitely horrible to me and cost everything in the world except the great compensation of my children. In the same letter, Laura goes on to say that she did love her husband, even though they had separated years before. 
And uh, curious enough, too, in one of her letters, she's writing about Christmas Eve to her daughter, and she says, we still continue with the Polish Christmas tradition. So it seemed like Laura, when it was Christmas Eve, would do the usual Polish Christmas traditional things. And considering that she wasn't Polish, and by this time she was long removed from Poland, it was kind of interesting to me that she still held to those Christmas traditions. So there was some long-term connection there. The Countess died in Santa Monica on August 25th, 1953 at age 75. The, the local newspaper simply reported that uh, services for Laura Gazdava de Turchinovich were held at St. Augustine by the Sea Episcopal Church. Mrs. de Turchinovich, 75, died Sunday in her home. She was born in Canada and been a Bay Area resident for six years. And among her survivors are her son, Peter, and a daughter, Wanda, Herman of El Paso, Texas. And that's roughly where I was going to end this little presentation. But one thing popped up thanks to this presentation. And it's curious where historical research can lead you. Because of the advertisements for this talk, I was contacted by a fellow from El Paso, Texas, named James Peterson. And he contacted me having seen the ad and said, I just bought some paintings by Wanda de Turchinovich. Wanda being uh, Laura's daughter. And so I was, I asked him to send us a few copies. And so he, I think he's picked, uh, pay, uh, purchased three or three. The one on the left is a self portrait by Wanda. That's not one of the ones he purchased, but the two in the middle, he just purchased last week and was interested about our talk and about Wanda. And I thought, nice coincidence that as you're doing this, uh, you know, the, the story goes on, in other words, you never end the research project because something always pops up that always allows you to embellish or add to it. And I'll just go back to this one. My final word on remembering Countess Laura is that I produced two books. The one on the left, uh, the patchwork, is really intended as a source book. I basically threw everything I could find about Laura into a book, and I gave it to uh, public libraries and university libraries so the record would be in some suitable locations. The one on the right is a slightly shortened, uh, edited version, but again, the same story about Laura. And again, for the same reason, I want her story to be preserved. And the one I, like I said, is in libraries, the other one's available. Should anybody be interested, uh, it's $20 from me. I do it myself and with a bit of uh, postage, then anybody can get a copy. So to conclude, just to say thank you to Laura for living an interesting life. Uh, I enjoyed following her. Uh, there's more, of course, to the story, but, and there's elements yet to be discovered. So, and I'm really proud that she's a St. Catharines girl. So I think that we should have some recognition of her as from being from St. Catharines. Maybe we should put a portrait in the, uh, historical museum or the public library or just to acknowledge this lady's existence and all she that, that she accomplished. And on that note, I'm done. And I see I went over a little bit, apologies. So you don't get to ask any questions. No, <laughs> unless you want to watch a hockey game. Thank you very much, Stan. That was a very, um, very fascinating talk. And um, what we'd like to do now is open it up to anybody who would like to ask a question, either raise your hand or uh, just ask Stan the question. I have a question, Stan. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? It's yeah, Elizabeth. Um, oh, does anyone, anyone ever find out what happened to her husband? Yes, uh, in, the, in the book I wrote, I have a little chapter. As far as I know, not long after the war, he remarried, uh, had children. The family continues on. Uh, he's deceased now, but he just lived another life in Poland. Uh, exactly why they didn't get back together, I couldn't tell you. It could be because Laura was, could be disenchanted with that totally different lifestyle in Eastern Europe. And once she got back to the North America, she decided to stay here. But yes, uh, you can actually find Stanislav uh, by, on Google, and you'll find out he continued with his career. He had an academic career, had a family, and as far as I can tell, lived happily ever after. 
And there's quite a few Turchinovich is still alive in Poland. If one had the ability to go and do and wanted to do a lot more research, you could follow up with those families. But I don't think they'd be able to tell you much about Laura. Like, yeah, he carried on. He didn't die. He, did, he just remarried. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you know if um, she knew um, Marcella Sembrick, um, another famous uh, Polish American uh, opera singer in the uh, first half of the first third of the 20th century? Um, in my book, I bring in uh, Sembrick because she was active in very much the same way. She was another opera singer of Polish descent, sang in North America, uh, was very popular. Uh, took on the Polish cause. Uh, she also got burned by the Polish so social committees who weren't very nice to her to get into details. So she ended up quitting in a way like Laura ended up quitting. I often wondered if the two men the the Polish. found no record of the meeting. It would be on, quite likely that they did meet because they were off in the same environment. They also both... You don't want to hear more questions? No, I'm done. Are we going to watch the program tonight? Or at least finish what we started? Yeah, finish what we started. No, okay. we the microphone off. Catherine? So I don't Wait. think so, Mark. <laughs> Are you... Um... Thank you. What? What happened? <laughs> And Sembridge has a museum in Upper New York State. It would be interesting to travel there and go through the documents that are there to see if there was a connection. They both would have met at the same time with people like Paderewski. So they would have been in Paderewski's company. Whether they were in Paderewski's company at exactly the same time, I don't know. I've got no record of it, but it would seem highly likely that they had come across one another. Did uh, Laura have a friendship with uh, Helena uh, Paderewska, Paderewski's wife? Uh, no, I think no. It, was the, it was the opposite. They did, oh. they did work together uh, initially. They got along quite well, and then they became competitors because uh, Miss, Mrs. Paderewska was setting up the Red Cross or the White Cross, and Laura was doing her Grace Americans. And they basically saw themselves in conflict with one another. Uh, the one that brought them together was uh, the pianist, Paderewski. He was a much more level-headed. And I've, what I've read of his wife, uh, she could be a challenge. And I think that's common knowledge if you read about her. Uh, she was a challenge. She aggravated a lot of people. Uh, and, and Laura and her eventually just went their separate ways and did their separate things. Well, the guy on the bench. And I think Laura spoke some Polish, although it's hard to know how much. She did travel with a translator. And one of her documents, which I doubt, she signed in that she could speak Yiddish and that her father could speak Yiddish. Now, your chances of coming across Yiddish in Germany and Poland were likely, but learning to actually speak it in, in the role she was in would have seen unlikely, but there's another little interesting twist that I, again, don't know how to answer, except I don't believe it. <laughs> Is her uh, former home in, in uh, Sawaki still standing? No, I have been in touch with the people there. Uh, they know less about her than we do. And from my understanding is the houses that area was torn apart both by World War I and World War II. So those old buildings that would have once been sort of royal or nobility fam houses are generally destroyed uh, during those wars and, and during the communist era too, they would take those apart. So from my understanding, there's nothing you can go visit to see where she lived or, or her cottage or her house, they're gone. In fact, probably the most information they have in Suvalki about Laura is whatever we've sent her, so. Yeah. Yeah. And her younger son, because at the end you see in the obituary, she had two sons, only one son is mentioned. My memory's right, he served in the United States forces and was killed. Oh. 
So he died in the 40s, I believe, in active duty. Um, so the one son went on and uh, Wanda married and lived in El Paso. That's why the paintings were there and that's why the fellow was able to find the paintings. It was a huge art thing back then. Any other questions, comments? Interesting. I've got to get the Google machine up. And Mark, just for the record, I did uh, channel this version a little bit more to St. Catharines than I would have if I was doing it with a different audience. For instance, a Polish audience, there might have been more references to some of the Polish events. But because we're in St. Catharines audience, I did pick whatever St. Catharines events I could to, to fill in that part of the story. Sure. Good. Well. Does it sound like that's uh, all the questions? Uh, very quiet, so I think we're done. Okay. Well, Stan, uh, on behalf of the Historical Society of St. Catharines, I think that's your presentation is a great way to end the first half of our presentation season. And we thank you uh, very much for a very interesting, very fascinating story. I mean, we've not heard of this Laura Blackwell before, and... Uh, She's led quite a life, and it's good that you researched all this. and And there's, it looks like there's, there's even more. You could, you could probably spend more time researching some facts about her. There are places. Well, uh, Mark mentioned the uh, Sembridge. I mean, going to their museum where they have their records, there's wouldn't surprise me at all if there was some crossover between the two of them. And then that guy who prosecutor has 27 feet of uh, material in the American archives in Washington. So I'm sure there's more stuff as to why she was challenged, who challenged her, why. Uh, but again, you'd have to spend days in Washington researching it. Okay, wrap it up. Yeah. It, would that be the Justice Department that has that, or where where is that? I think it's the actual archives. I, I did look okay. it up, and I, this uh, a district attorney has 27 boxes of material. So I, I would expect that somewhere in there is the case he brought against Laura and, and, and uh, what, it, what it was based on and who were the complainers and things like that. So it never ends. Like I said, uh, you, know, you can keep on going with this, but at a certain point, you have to draw a line and say, time for something else. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew from St. Catharines has raised his hand. He's got a question. Matthew? Uh, thanks. So uh, you never found any um, documents that would indicate that they had a, a legal divorce? No. And so you said he went on to marry somebody else. Uh, would he have had, to, would, does that imply that he was sort of dishonestly said, oh yes, of course I'm not married. I can marry this other person. I can't really tell you, but I can tell you if you're living through wars, files disappear, records vanish. It's not hard to recreate. I discovered, I'll give you another totally disconnected example, but about six years ago, I discovered I have a half brother in Poland that I had no connection to. Didn't wasn't aware of him. He was my half brother. My dear old dad back in 1930 had a liaison. Nobody knew anything about it. They know they never married. Uh, but and again, in Europe, I suspect if you're of an upper crust, the ability to make things happen uh, are pretty easy. In other words, if you have money and position, I guess it's true anywhere. <laughs> but but in, in that society, I would think money and position would have overcome whatever the issues were. And, and I just don't know because Laura went to find him and all I know is that there's no record of him her, them coming together. They might have even have met, but there is no record that I have that shows that they actually met. And of course, at that time, war was going on, the country's in turmoil, so it wasn't exactly easy. And if he was serving within an armed forces, he would have been restricted in his movement. So, uh, and by that time, she was supporting Lithuania, whereas he was fighting for the Poles. So you've got the usual uh, complications in Eastern Europe as to whose side are you really on and which side are you on today and that kind of thing. So I just don't know, but no, all I know is that somehow he remarried. Her husband remarried? Yeah. Um, Stan, I have another question. 
And that is, it's okay. I'm, can you hear me? No, because you have to unmute yourself. I did yeah. unmute myself. It's all right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that her sister lived on Ontario Street South. A, yes. a number of people here tonight live on that street, which is now South Drive. Do you know the number? She would have um, been. I think I do. I'd have to check. And I don't know if it's in these notes or somewhere else. There was actually a fairly lengthy description of that T, which I scratched out of my presentation, but it goes into some detail. Uh, so I could certainly send you a little more detail on whatever, and I'd have to check my notes for uh, uh, an address. But obviously this was a prominent house if that's where the University Women's Group met and had their tea. So I'm assuming it's one of the fine old houses on Ontario Street, but I, I, I'll see if I can find Ontario it. Ontario Street South, which is yeah. South Drive. It's yeah. a different thing. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, if you could let me know. If I, if I have it here, let me just write myself a note. Well, later. Okay. <laughs> Address. Yeah. I can send you the broader description at least because then you'll get a few. There were a few more names mentioned as to who was there, who was officiating, uh, who was serving tea, even that kind of thing is mentioned. So Great. I'll, I'll send that to you by email. Great. Thanks, Dan. Are you going to post the, your presentation on the Historical Society's website? Yeah, it, it gets recorded and is posted on YouTube and also uh, with a link or the, the uh, video itself will be on the website. Great. I'll be preserved. Preserved forever, Stan. <laughs> yeah, that's a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> That was terrific. I hope everybody enjoyed it. The comments are coming back very positive. And um, so that's it for tonight's presentation. We're right on time. And uh, once again, thanks, Stan. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending. And thank you for being members of the Historical Society and continuing to support us. We will uh, we'll reach out to you before September, and we'll give you a rundown of what our lineup is for the second half of our presentation season. Until then, everybody stay safe, take care, and we'll see you in the fall. Good night. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Thank you, Stan. Bye-bye.